Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, we are so excited to have you here. I am Dana Pleski in the communications office at Sweet Briar, and I will just sort of let uh, let us ride for just a minute or so while every we give everyone sort of a chance to join us um, for this this wonderful talk with uh, with Russ Werneth this evening. So. I know we've got a lot of you uh, in the queue and waiting to join. This looked like a very popular event. So we are so excited to welcome you all. And it looks like we have people from all walks of life in all areas and perhaps all over the country as well. So we're just gonna give it a second and let everyone uh, join. Um, and then we'll sort of do some introductions and then Russ will give his talk. And then towards the end, we'll have time for a Q&A session. So uh, we do have some pre-questions that will sort of be answered perhaps as we go along and feel free to add in the chat uh, your questions. And then when we get to that portion, we can, we can run through those. I know I anticipate we'll probably have quite a bit of questions and you will get through as many as we can, um, but, but uh, and you know, we're scheduled for an hour so, and I know we could probably go on for much longer than that. But um, anyways, it looks like we've got quite a few of you here already, which is excellent. And I will perhaps go ahead. Let's, let's wait, let's wait just a little bit longer. I'll wait for another minute or so. Um, I hope everyone has been having a, a, good, a good day, a good week, a good fall and happy early Thanksgiving to everyone. And it's been beautiful here, it's unseasonably warm, but beautiful on campus. So I hope you've been enjoying some of the, some of the pictures we've been sharing uh, on social of, of Sweetbriar, so. Okay, I think I'm gonna go ahead and um, I will turn off the camera here and I will turn the show over to Dr. Bethany Brinkman. Bethany, please go ahead and introduce this wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for um, coming once again. Um, welcome to the Hubble 30th anniversary presentation by Russ Werneth um, and hosted by Sweetbriar College. Uh, first, I'd like to take a moment of reflection to recognize Veterans Day and all the members of the Armed Forces. So um, just a quick moment of reflection here. Thank you for your service. Um, I am Dr. Bethany Brinkman. I'm director of the Margaret Jones Wiley 45 engineering program. Um, since our first graduates in 2008, um, Sweetbriar is proud to be one of the only two women's colleges with an ABET accredited engineering degree. Our graduates go on to do just about everything um, from grad school to industry in the fields of mechanical, electrical, civil, environmental systems, and nuclear engineering. Um, we are really proud of what they've accomplished. And I'd like to highlight one of our graduates here tonight, um, Isabel Joyner, who will be introducing our speaker tonight. Um, she's from the class of 20. Uh, she was a joy to have in class. She was always prepared and enthusiastic. Um, she majored in engineering and minored in physics, as many of our engineers do. And she did a lot of research on pulsars while she was here. Um, while at Sweetbriar, she was also a competitive writer for IHSA. And now she works for Boeing as a propulsion engineer supporting the core stage thrust vector control system for space launches. Uh, her hobbies are photography, traveling, and painting watercolors. So I'd like to turn it over to Isabel now to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Bethany. Um, all right, I'm going to give an introduction now for Russell L. Werneth. Russell L. Werneth an aerospace engineer at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, was the extravehicular activity manager for the Hubble Space Telescope project. Mr. Werneth contributed to numerous programs throughout his long federal career, but he earned the most acclamation for his many efforts during all five of the very successful Hubble servicing missions. Mr. Werneth has played an important role in several projects, including designing unique tools, procedures, and training that the astronauts used during their EVAs to upgrade maintain and repair the Hubble Space Telescope. During his career, he also served as the lead manager for astronaut tool development at Goddard for NASA's two critical return to, return to flight space shuttle missions in 1995, when astronauts performed first of its kind spacewalking demonstrations 
using repair tools that GSFC and Johnson Space Center teams created. After retiring from civil service in 2007, Russ returned to serve as educational and public outreach engineer for Hubble Space Telescope and Astrophysics at Goddard. Mr. Werneth graduated from the University of Maryland College Park with bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical and electrical with, in mechanical engineering and also received a master's degree in engineering administration from the George Washington University in Washington, DC. He previously was instructor and lecturer at the University of Maryland and adjunct professor at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. He is also a longtime national officer of Ta Beta Pi, the Collegiate Engineering Honor Society, and he serves on the University of Maryland's Engineering Alumni Association Board. Mr. Werneth has been recognized with such prestigious awards as NASA's Exceptional Achievement Medal for his work on the Space Shuttle Return to Flight effort and Hubble servicing missions, and the Astronaut Silver Snoopy Award for his efforts on the EVA intensive space shuttle service, servicing missions to Hubble. The University of Maryland presented him with the College of Engineering Centennial Award, an honor bestowed on their top 100, 100 engineering graduates. His hobbies are photography and Ford Mustangs. And I'll pass it on to you, Russ. Thanks very, very much. Isabel, that, uh, that was a great introduction. Uh, I hope that I can live up to what you just said. So I want to talk to you about the 30 plus years that Hubble Space Te Telescope has been on orbit. And uh, what we've done with the engineering, especially during servicing missions and the resulting science. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. <laughs> okay, so, whoop, back up, please. Okay. Um, as you heard, I work at Goddard Space Flight Center, one of NASA's centers in Greenbelt, Maryland, and I do educational and public outreach. Next slide. And one thing it does is to get me out to talk about Hubble. One of the things I really like to talk about because I'm proud of what we've done for Hubble Space Telescope over 30 some years and get to talk to kids, go to conferences, go to schools. And um, now I do it virtually. Next slide. And one of the conferences I went to was actually in Hawaii uh, almost a year ago. And I met this young girl from Sweetbriar College, and I was so impressed. And that that is Isabel there. I was so impressed that um, I told her what I do, and she invited me down to give a talk at Sweetbriar. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to be there because of COVID. Next slide. And the other thing I like to do is to introduce people to others at NASA. And here's a picture of Dr. John Mather, who won a Nobel Prize, and Isabel Joyner. And on the right hand of the slide, you'll see the next big telescope for NASA. And that's a model of the James Webb Space Telescope. And hopefully at the end, I might have uh, some words to say about that. I know I've gotten questions already about it. Next. So Hubble has been involved in many areas of science, astronomy, astrophysics. And I'm gonna talk about the engineering primarily and how we got Hubble launched and serviced. Okay, next slide. So I work on the space side of NASA, next. And our job, our objective is to put observatories, telescopes, 
instruments in space, probes that look into space because we always have to explore and find out what's out there. So I'm not going to talk about all these. I'm going to only talk about the thing I know most about, and that's Hubble Space Telescope. Next. So at NASA and all the other nine centers for NASA around the country, we hire all kinds of folks to work to get our mission accomplished. And I'm on the engineering side, but we hire scientists, folks that are engineers, that become astronauts, chemists, machinists, all kinds of folks. Next. So those of us who've had the fortune and we're real proud of working on Hubble Space Telescope, we call ourselves Hubble Hoggers. Next. So we also have some acronyms. HST, you probably already know without me saying it, is Hubble Space Telescope. Next. And the telescope was a very unique design, a Cassegrainian design that would be in space, not affected by cloud covers or radiation close to the Earth and uh, has a primary mirror and a secondary mirror and scientific instruments. But the unique part of Hubble, go ahead, next slide. The unique part of Hubble is, I like to say it was take a partable. Not an English word, but I'm an engineer, don't need to use English words, we can innovate and make new words. So take a partable means that the scientific instruments, a lot of electronics in the equipment bays, the solar arrays, many things on Hubble were deliberately designed and engineered to be taken apart, taken out of the telescope and replaced by an astronaut crew. And that was because things break, things wear out, and we get new technology. So over the years, we've had five servicing missions to replace things in Hubble, to bring it to new technology or to, to replace things were, that were breaking or had all, had, we were thinking that it might break, preventive maintenance. Next. So this is a picture of Hubble when it was being built out in California. You can see a person in a bunny suit to get an idea of both their sizes. Next slide. And this is the large 2.4 meter diameter primary mirror. Next slide. So the idea was to put a telescope in low earth orbit, have it look out into the universe, send data back to a TDRA satellite, a, a tracking and data relay satellite, and then send that down to, to a ground station in New Mexico, and then on to Maryland, Goddard Space Flight Center, and then up to Baltimore, Maryland for the Space Telescope Science Institute. Next slide. So here's the idea, really a novel idea. This is a model of the space shuttle with a model of Hubble Space Telescope showing the payload doors open and the robot arm, the RMS, remote manipulator system, reaching out to Hubble when they team up in orbit and temporarily placing it on a fixture that we had in the payload bay of the shuttle. And then the astronauts could go out two at a time and do the repair work or upgrading work that we had trained for. Next slide. So some information on Hubble. It's 43 and a half feet tall. It weighs about 13 and a half tons. We've added a few things to increase its weight. And it's been at an altitude of 340 miles for over 30 years. Now, can you guess what its speed is in miles per hour? 
we'll take a couple of folks. If you unmute yourself, what do you think its speed is in miles per hour as it orbits the Earth? Eighteen thousand seventeen. Okay, we got some close answers. Um, it is next slide. Seventeen thousand to seventeen five hundred miles per hour. It's got to go that fast to keep moving around the Earth. Okay. Now, one of the other slides or one of the other acronyms in this slide is EVA, extravehicular activity. That's when the astronaut goes out, in this case, from the space shuttle, the convenient environment, safe environment, and does work outside of that vehicle, extravehicular activity. Next slide. This is the famous picture of somebody on the moon and that somebody is Buzz Aldrin and reflected in his helmet is Neil Armstrong, the first person on the moon. So I use this because it shows an EVA, this particular one on the moon. Next slide. And if any of you had the chance to go down for our 50th anniversary of landing on the moon in Washington, DC. This is the Saturn projected onto the Washington Monument. You saw that absolute tremendous event as was the launch way back in 1969. Next slide. And you can probably run to the post office and still get these stamps commemorating the first moon landing back in 1969. They were issued last year. So we've had six Hubble missions. The first was its launch in 1990 and then followed as planned with servicing missions. We weren't sure how many there would be. We've had five, five very, very successful servicing missions. And I'm not going to go through what we changed out, all that's listed on these, this slide, but I will talk about some of the highlights in the training that we did with the astronauts for those successful missions. Next slide. If you get to Goddard Space Center in Maryland, you'll see the largest clean room that we know of in the world. And we needed a clean facility where we had the actual flight instruments and we had mock-ups, full-scale models of the portion of the telescope that's in the upper center of the picture. And we brought in astronauts and ourselves to be trained on what had to be done for each of those five servicing missions. Next slide. And this is a picture of astronaut Mike Good in the blue top to his bunny suit. And he's working with one of two battery modules that we changed out on our last mission. We're all in the clean room, so we have bunny suits on to keep everything as clean as possible. Next slide. So we train the astronauts we insist on retraining. And that also means that we retrain ourselves also as this process goes on because we support from the ground. Next slide. This is astronaut Mike Massimino and he's not in the clean room, but he has his astronaut gloves on. And one of my jobs was to lead the team that built the tools. The, very special tools that are needed to work in space. And Mike has a tool we designed for our last servicing mission in 2009, a mini power tool. And he's working on a special board that we built that lines up with fasteners that he had to remove. And these fasteners, there were about a hundred of them, nobody ever thought that 
we'd be able to get into the electronics behind that. But there was a failure. We took it as a challenge. That panel was not meant to be removed, but we built this board to place over it so we could line up with all the screws and fasteners, have them come out and float into a cavity between the board and the the face of that part of the instrument on hobble. And it was very, very successful. Next slide. We also practiced underwater. In fact, we spent hundreds of hours underwater with full scale models of the portions of the telescope that we need, but not necessarily high fidelity because we didn't need high fidelity. The astronauts went in on suits that, of course, wouldn't be used in space. We went in on scuba and either helped out or stayed out of the way. In this case, we have the framework of the solar array and going through an end-to-end -end change out for that solar array. This is in the neutral buoyancy lab at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Next slide. We also went to a neutral buoyancy lab at the beginning of the program in, at Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And the only one at a university that we know of anywhere in the world close by us in Greenbelt, Maryland at the University of Maryland. Next slide. So now we're leaving, we're down at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. On the left, you see the instruments and the containers for the instruments lined up as they will be put into the payload bay of the shuttle. They're at a clean room down at Kennedy Space Center. On the right hand side, you see the payload bay. Once it's been loaded in with all the instruments, the tools and things that we are carrying to space, and the astronauts come through and double check the location and what everything looks like right before they get to take off for a Hubble servicing mission. Next slide. And unfortunately, we won't see sites like this unless it's with the new program that Isabel's working on. This is the space shuttle being lifted in the vehicle assembly building down at Kennedy in a parallel process to what we're doing to, to get ready all of the Hubble equipment that's going to launch on a servicing mission. Next slide. This, of course, shows the stack up of the shuttle on the, the equipment that takes it out to the launch pad. And I know you're gonna like that picture. I do because I took it. Hopefully you do too. Next slide, please. And this is an actual picture taken before our 2009 servicing mission. And the rainbow is not Photoshopped in there. That is real. I did not take that picture, unfortunately. Okay, next. This is the crew that we had for STS-125, our fourth servicing mission that went, went to Hubble. Um, actually, it was our fifth mission. I'll have to explain that. We had a 3A and a 3B because we had to launch back in 1999, make sure we were home with the shuttle safely by the end of the year because of Y2K. So we weren't finishing, finished up with everything that was ready for the requirements for the third mission. So we made sure that we called it 3A because we had to finish it up with 3B. Of course, that mission was successful, both were successful. There were no problems with Y2K. Next. And that's the publicity poster that the crew liked. Next. 
Now we're back in 1990, April 24th, we launched Space Shuttle Discovery. And that's what put Hubble into orbit on the next day. So it's been over 30 years that Hubble has been up sending back tremendous images of what it sees in space. Next. And if you've ever seen a, a launch, they are spectacular. This one happens to be a night launch, but daytime, nighttime, absolutely spectacular. Next. Now, this one has nothing to do with Hubble Space Telescope, but I thought I'd include it because it's a neat picture of the shuttle and heading up, not to Hubble, but to space station. This is about the only way this picture could have been taken by an astronaut on space station. Next. So when we launched back in 1990, we had a lot of bad publicity and actually it was deserved. We did not check the primary mirror. There was another one that it could have been checked against made by another manufacturer, but because of time, money, politics, whatever, it wasn't done. Very unusual that NASA does not double check. So we goofed. Next slide. So the picture on the left is what we saw after the launch mission in 1990. And we had to have a servicing mission to correct that problem. And the problem was this 2.4 meter diameter primary mirror was too flat around the outside edges. It was only about the thickness or 1 50th of the th thickness of a piece of human hair. A spherical aberration around the outs outside edge of the mirror. But in space optics, it sure made a difference. So our challenge on the first servicing mission, we had a new requirement to do something about that problem with the initial launch of the telescope. And after 1993, with an innovative solution as best as possible, essentially we put in contact lenses to give the image of the, the same image in space that you see on the right. And we are really proud that that put Hubble back in taking the, the images that it needed to. Next slide. Here is astronaut John Grunsfeld on the left and Rick Lenahan on the right in the airlock preparing to go out for their spacewalk, EVA extravehicular activity. Next slide. Here we are on console. Uh, this console set happens to be in uh, Greenbelt, Maryland. I supported the consoles down at Johnson Space Center and we had teams around the clock watching everything as long as we were getting a downlink. And you can see uh, in the background, the photo of what's happening on orbit. Um, we watched everything going on. We made sure that they were doing, the astronauts were doing what was to be trained. We had trained and that we were successful. Next slide. Next slide, please. So, we were successful for five servicing missions. And we went through this procedure and um, don't see the next slide. Bethany? Yeah, we're, we're getting pictures of the astronauts um, out in space. Okay, right not now. showing up on my screen. Okay. Okay. I can fix the telescope, but I can't fix this laptop. <laughs> so, 
So, yeah, if, okay. if, folks, if folks can hold on just for two seconds um, while Russ brings up his um, his ancillary um, uh, phone so that he can see what slides are projecting. Okay, sorry about that. I'm going to see if I can call in on my cell phone. So... I let, so I guess um, while while Russ is dialing in, um, there's a couple of questions that have come in in the Q and A session, um, talking about um, first if the how long will the Hubble be maintained and okay. um, and sort of what is the next what is the next time servicing mission scheduled for it? Okay, let me uh, finish dialing in on my phone and I'll multiplex and answer those questions. Okay. So the first the first question was how long do we expect Hubble? Yeah, how long do we expect Hubble to be maintained for? The folks that have run the analyses and statistics said that or figured out that it should last from up to 2025 or 2030. Um, so are there any um, servicing missions planned in the meantime then for it? You're, you're, you're muted right now, Russ, I think from your end. Still, still muted. Okay. Folks can just hold on for a little bit, please, while we um, while we address the technical difficulties and look at the awesome pictures of the Hubble telescope. In the meantime, <laughs> we'll be we'll be right back with you. And thank you to the thank you for the messages of support in the chat. We do appreciate that. I think we're all um, we are all uh, used to zooming by now, and it's uh, various and sundry intricacies um, that come with everything. Um, so. Russ, if you can, Russ, if you can hear me, would it be, would it be helpful if I just um, gave a quick description of the slide um, before and so that you could, you could talk from that? or we might have lost them all together. Russ, can you hear me? Okay, perfect. All right, I see his phone popping up now. Yeah, Russ, can, okay. I added it to talking permission. So let's see if that works. Russ, can you hear us? Russ, can, can you hear us on your phone? Okay. Uh, let's see here. One moment, please. Thanks everybody for sticking with us. Um, I know that we have a great, um, great bunch of people here today. Um, this was certainly um, first when Russ was going to come down and visit. This was intended for um, you know Sweetbriar College students and local college 
students. And we tried to keep that um, sort of spirit going here as we went into um, you know, virtual COVID mode, um, really encouraging college students and high school students to come and, and listen to this awesome lecture, especially since Russ does a lot of outreach. And I've, I've seen some comments tracking through that this is very, very much, you know, networking for NASA is um, folks uh, dream job. And I think Isabel, that was that was certainly true for you. I know um, when you were when you were here at school. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. No, it was pretty. I mean, Russ and I met at this conference, which was major influence um, from Sweetbriar because I was working on radio astronomy there. So. Um, so that pulled me to the conference, this, the American Astronomical Society, and that's where I met Russ um, in this outreach situation. So it's it's pretty incredible what networking and connecting with people can do and um, opportunities that it can bring. So, <laughs> Yeah. How long had you been in interested in NASA and space and everything? I was influenced my really my first year of college and then that's when I jumped into radio astronomy research and um, and then really just pursuing aerospace engineering opportunities following that so yeah because you and Dr. Hyman looked a lot for the signals from pulsars that came yeah that was our research was looking at um, what are called pulsars or um, rotating neutron stars, um, which would have been detected by telescopes like Hubble. So it all ties back together, <laughs> literally everything. So, um, yeah. That's great. I don't know if I can answer any questions. <laughs> um, all right, Russ, are you able to jump back on with us? I am trying. Can oh, you hear yeah, me? Yeah, we have yes, we can. And, I and, am trying both well, through my iPhone and through my laptop. But we, I will not get back in. Let's let's not worry too much. Hey, what, I'll, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll I can just describe this. I can just say what's describe the slide to you and go ahead and um, let you talk from that if that would be um, all right with you. Okay. Okay. So we've got and a picture meantime, of a spacewalk. <laughs> okay, that is uh, an actual picture from space, and uh, during our one of our servicing missions, I don't know which one it is because I can't see it. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. And then we have another one okay, that's, next. Um, that's a flipped spacewalk. So you can um, certainly, you can see oh, um, oh, Earth underneath okay. in the Hubble attached okay. to the Bay of the... Okay, where is the Earth, up or down? Down. Okay, so the previous one was that one as we normally show it. And this one is as people expect it with the earth at, at the bottom of the picture. But in space really doesn't make much difference, except in the case of Hubble missions, we flew the shuttle upside down. That way we could control the amount of sunlight hitting not only the payload bay, but the open bays that uh, the astronauts had open to where they were doing the work. Okay. Our next slide of, is of an astronaut going, um, looks like uh, going into one of the bays to retrieve some equipment. That is exactly right. <laughs> it has to be. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, our next slide is an astronaut um, upside down working, uh, sort of rotating around one of the bays as well. Okay. Probably a um, photo op cool. showing near near zero gravity. So uh, if if there's an instrument there that weighs seven hundred pounds, it weighs virtually nothing. 
Mm. Okay. Um, our next slide is a, a bigger panoramic of uh, astronaut moving, uh, two astronauts actually on an EVA, uh, moving a large gray box-like thing around. Uh-huh, okay. And that so must I'm, be correct, thank you. It says it's installing COSTAR during STS-61 um, uh, Hubble Space Telescope SM. Oh, okay. And COSTAR was a large scientific instrument at the bottom of the telescope that was used to, in fact, part of its name was corrective optics. So on the first servicing mission, there was a series of small mirrors placed in the light path that were able to be adjusted from the ground. And that's what solved the spherical aberration problem, a unique novel solution and brought back the images to maybe 85, 90%, maybe a little higher than originally intended without the flat, that little bit of flatness of the primary mirror. Hmm. Okay. Our next slide is a picture of Hubble um, from inside the space shuttle. Okay, so as the astronauts are leaving, they uh, this is what they see when the remote manipulator system arm picks Hubble up off of its carrier, releases the latches, and gets ready to be sent back into orbit a new telescope each of those five times. Um, okay. we, have, we have the space shuttle coming home safely, landing with a parachute behind it. Okay. Great. Um, and then Next. we have um, a blank blue slide. And That's... a question, why? Okay. Why don't we do all this? Well, our requirement was to place Hubble in orbit to explore. We always have to explore. And getting a telescope up above the at atmosphere getting it to have tremendous pointing accuracy. Uh, we want to bring back great science. And there's probably been about a million and a half images taken by Hubble that have been brought back over 30 plus years. And then the next slide should be uh, some of those images. Yeah, we have a star field. It's the first slide here. Uh-huh. Um, next up is a... Okay, um, that, that is one of the deep fields that really surprised everybody as to how many planets, stars, black holes were out there. So there have been a series of uh, what we call deep fields. Uh, next slide is a nebula. So, um, okay. Just showing a lot of really awesome formations. Of, I think it's um, the Crab Crab Nebula, I'm pretty sure. Okay, cool. Okay, thanks, Isabel. <laughs> All right, and then we have, um, I guess, another nebula, lots of traceries of uh, rainbow colors oh. all going through. Uh huh. Okay, that um, they are not real colors. Well, we don't know if they are. But the colors are assigned by scientists, depending on temperature, um, chemical makeup. So as neat as that is, and that's called Veil Nebula, it's, um, it might not be those real colors if we were out there. Okay, the next one is a spiral galaxy, just like our own. Wow. Tell, tell me when you change the slides okay. and I know I just, now what they are. Just changed I, I again. I can't see them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Does it look like a butterfly? It does. Okay. This one we call butterfly nebula because that's what it looks like. And it's actually the death of a star. A star is emitting gases in two directions at the end of its life. Okay. Next slide. Pillars of creation. Okay. Now this is the beginning of life within 
these pillars, and this is called Eagle Nebula, there are stars being born. We can't, well, we'd have to really enlarge it to see the areas. Okay, next slide. Infrared. Okay, this is the same image, that same pillar of creation taken with infrared sensors. So you can see infrared, of course, is picking up heat energy. So you can see everything in the background. Now, if you go to the next slide, yep. you can see the comparison between those two. They were taken years apart, same place in the sky. And you can see the difference between, on the left, it's visible light, essentially, and on the right is infrared. Next slide. Okay, a little bit further out, and then... 30th happy, anniversary. Happy 30th anniversary. Yep. July was our 30th anniversary, and us Hubble huggers are hoping we have quite a few more. Next slide. That's a collage of many of the images, certainly not all of them, that Hubble has taken over 30 plus years. Next mm -hmm. slide. Come visit us at Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Yep. I can see the slides now, Bethany, not from your, from my copy of the presentation. Okay, perfect. So if you get a chance to get to Greenbelt, Come visit us. That building is where the large, largest clean room in the world is. Next slide. You can visit us online. You can Google NASA Hubble, Hubble sites. There's plenty of information. An image each day comes out. We'd like to let the folks know all around the world what Hubble is seeing. Okay. We're on Twitter at <laughs> NASA underscore Hubble. Next slide. And if you get out to a, an IMAX theater that's still showing it, Hubble IMAX 3D is a tremendous movie. You would expect me to say that. And it is a, a movie that includes images because we took a, an, an IMAX camera. We carved out space for it on two of our missions. The first and the last missions had IMAX cameras. So Destiny in Space and Hubble 3D are two tremendous movies showing what happened out there. Next slide. Yep. This, is, this is a book by one of our astronauts who was on two of our missions, Mike Massimino, and um, tremendous easy read book. Mike's a tremendous guy and uh, great author. Recommended reading. If I can give a homework assignment, can I? <laughs> I think so. Okay. Um, next slide. Yep. Hubble tool time. If you Google that, you will see, next slide, uh, John Grunsfeld, and I was on some of these. Um, we put together some videos to talk about Hubble servicing missions. So if you Google on YouTube Hubble servicing missions or Hubble tool time, you will find about four episodes that that we put on uh, that are pretty interesting to talk about what we've done on Hubble servicing missions. Next slide. Okay. NASA wants you. Yep. We want, we want you all to come work for us. If you're looking for a job, love to have you work for NASA. It is a tremendous place to work. Next slide should be a blank one. Mm -hmm. And if you want, we can stop there and go through questions. 
I cannot see the chat, so you'll I have can, to ask. I can relate some of the questions, Russ. Okay. Um, so one of the earlier questions was, um, oh, well, we already answered when will Hubble be decommissioned? And you mentioned um, how they decide what colors to put on the images of nebulae uh -huh. and galaxies. Um, uh -huh. So one question was, what is a nebula? <laughs> a nebula essentially is a creation of dust and particles in space. That's pretty okay. good. <laughs> um, will the Space Telescope Institute at John Hopkins be used for the James Webb Telescope? I don't know if you would know the answer to that question. But... Okay. Um, if we go back to the slides, Bethany, can you put the slides back on? Yep. If they're not? Yep, they're still on. Okay. What does it say? What's after Hubble? What's after Hubble? Okay, so that question leads us into the next and next slide. The next big telescope will be the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST. Remember I said that Hubble was 340 miles up? James Webb, not James Webb, the person who has passed away, we, but we named this telescope after him. The Webb Telescope will be 1 million miles in space at a Lagrange point. So unlike Hubble, it's not designed to be serviced. Unlike Hubble, it only looks in infrared, but that's fine because to look into deep space, that's what we need. And we're not sure of the launch right now. It was originally scheduled for early next year, but because of COVID and other situations, it has been delayed again. And um, it's also, an, if you go to the next slide, it's also an origami project. It doesn't fit into the French rocket that will launch it. And we knew that ahead of time. So it meant a big engineering challenge of how to design it. So it is, the parts of it will fold up. Two side segments of the mirror will fold up and a lot of parts of it have to unfurl as it's heading out to space for a million miles. So when it gets out there, it will be fully deployed and it'll be checked out for equilibrium and hopefully everything will be put into the proper position. It is a tremendous challenge. And of course, a million miles out, it can't be serviced. So we, and in answer to some of the questions I got ahead of time, hopefully Hubble and James Webb Space Telescope will be operating at the same time, sometime in the future, and they can look at the same places in the sky to make comparisons. Now, Hubble won't be able to look as far back in the time and space as Webb will be able to, but there are places they both can take a look at and we're waiting for that day. Okay. Now, okay. another question mm -hmm. I got ahead of time was about the heat shield on our servicing mission. Because we were approved to go back to Hubble, but didn't have the safe haven of being able to, if we were to go to International Space Station, which is about 220 miles up in orbit. Um, you can't live in space station. So we did have to make a, an inspection, just like they do in going to space station for the space shuttle to check for tiles that caused the tremendous disaster with the Columbia mission. So in doing that, the uh, Canadian arm, the remote manipulator system was used to make 
an inspection of the tiles. So that answers a question that someone had sent in. Okay. Any other questions there on the chat? Yep. Um, so there was a question that was, what inspired you to work for NASA and specifically the field of work that you um, you were in? Okay. Well, I've always been interested in space. And um, my decisions took me to study mechanical engineering because it was more general. And then after I graduated, I had an opportunity to work as a civilian for a Navy lab in Silver Spring, Maryland. And I was influenced by professors. So I went to work there. Um, one lesson to learn, of course, is that for most of us, we move around in our careers. So I had the opportunity there to work on many different projects. One of them included robotics. And the Navy lab decided that that wasn't very high anymore on their priority list. So I had networked and met some folks at NASA. And actually, rather late in my career, I made a big decision to go to NASA, Goddard Space Flight Center. The best decision I had ever made. I could not have been more fortunate to get in on the ground floor of Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission. So I had an unusual path to get there. And uh, I finally retired and then I failed retirement and went back to work there so I could give educational and public outreach information about Hubble Space Telescope. How's that for an answer? Pretty good. Um, okay, I have a little more of a technical question. What precautions, okay. what precautions were used to make make sure mirrors, glass, and other sensitive parts didn't break during launch? Well, that's a great question. The um, Everything for Hubble for its original launch back in 1990, the decisions were made that everything building up the telescope, everything was structurally sound. So, if anybody had an idea to replace that primary mirror in space, that would have been impossible. Um, so that wasn't a serious consideration when we had the spherical aberration problem. So everything was well protected. Tests were run, vibration tests were run to make certain that there wouldn't be damage to any part of the telescope when it was launched. And it turned out that everything was successful. The mirror problem was due to incorrect manufacturing and testing. So that had nothing to do with launch, withstanding launch loads, vibration, things like that. So excellent testing was done ahead of time. Okay. All right. Um, someone asked, what new objects can we expect to see from the James Webb Telescope? Well, with James Webb Space Telescope, we are thinking that it will look back in time and space to the big, the big Bang, when the Big Bang happened. So it can look back further than, than Hubble can. And there are probably many, many things just like when Hubble was launched, we weren't sure what it would be able to see. And James Webb will be the same way. So there'll be plenty of new, exciting discoveries by looking back through more distance and back through time. Okay. All right, I can, you want me to ask one more question or I don't know how it's 5.30 on the dot right now. Yeah, I think one more question would be good and then we'll wrap up. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. 
someone asked, why does the James Webb Space Telescope have a hexagonal design? Well, somebody who made that design took a look at bees. Why did they make, make hexagonal bees nest? Why are some eyes be in the shape of a hexagon? And in the case of Hubble, uh, of course, it's a curved, big old mirror. In the case of James Webb, it had to be segmented so that it could fold up. And then each of those segments are controlled. So when it gets to space, it can be controlled from the ground with redundant positioning sensors on it and activators. So the most efficient and probably biologically correct design for a lens or an eye or a mirror would be a hexagon. I okay. actually, I, I, there's one more question that I think will be um, really beneficial. <laughs> uh -huh. so, um, Emily asked, what is your advice for students who would like to pursue a career at NASA? Well, the biggest thing of course, is to take courses in STEM and do well in them and you will define th you will find things that you like or maybe things you don't like and probably the greatest step in getting a job at nasa is to apply for a either a high school or a college intern program at goddard or any of the other centers we have a tremendous internship program. And that way you get your foot in the door, you work in an area, you see what the facility is like, and what the work is done. You can network while you're there and possibly come back for another internship, maybe in another area, or you could be accepted for a job. But that, that is probably the easiest way and the best way right now to get a job at NASA. And the other way would be to work through a contractor. Essentially, that's what Isabel has done. She works for Boeing and they support Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville. And uh, that, is, that is the other way to uh, get either to work directly at NASA or for a NASA contractor. Okay. Thank you. So thank you once again, Russ, for uh, joining us and showing your sh showing all your knowledge. Um, really appreciate it. And thanks to everybody for um, joining Sweetbriar College for the Hubble 30th anniversary presentation. Um, hope everybody has a good evening and thank you once again for joining us. Okay. And Bethany, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dana and Amy. And special thanks now to to um, Isabel, who took over for me. I certainly apologize for not being able to stay connected for the whole time. Like I say, I can fix the telescope, but I can't fix this laptop of mine. Yeah, so you thank you very much. You're getting a round of applause in the comments, so. Okay, okay. And if... Uh, you get any comments in chat, uh, if people want to contact me, uh, if Bethany, if you can send those on to me. And I promise I will come down to Sweetbriar when these COVID, COVID restrictions get listed. Get we'll, lifted. we'll certainly do. I'll, I'll pass along any, anything, any questions that come afterwards and we will, we will host okay. you as soon as we can. Okay, thank you very much. Th thank you. Thanks, Russ. Good night, all. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Good night. I appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.